Good morning, everybody. Um, if I can introduce you to David Gale, who um, was a co-director of Lumiere and Son, um, and he's going to talk about the early days. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hilary. Good morning, Garth. <clears throat> it was the best of easy times. Bottled water had not yet been invented. <laughs> so there was no need to carry it in the street in case you got thirsty. If you wanted water, you had to go to a tap. If you were going to a friend's house, you'd have to wait until you got there and then ask, excuse me, do you have a tap? If they said yes, which they usually did because most people had taps by the early 70s, you could then say, please can I have a glass of water? Similarly, all phones, then known as telephones, were wired to the wall by a short piece of electrical cord. If you're in a field and you wanted to talk to your friend, you couldn't. You had to go home. If you were going to meet somebody at the cinema and they died, you might stand there for hours before you knew. But there were seasons and it was fairly easy to live without much money. In 1973, the plastic water bottle was invented and its rapidly established ubiquity encouraged an adventurous spirit in the youth <laughs> who are now able to travel further from home without fear of dehydration. A less whimsical adventurousness was also in evidence. It could be seen not only in matters of style or popular music, but in the intensification of the bombing campaigns of the provisional IRA, in a rapidly, rapidly rising inflation under the Conservative government, and in the three-day week introduced in late 1973 by Edward Heath as a means of reducing electricity consumption. I think it was the Face magazine in the early 80s that first dubbed the 70s as the decade that taste forgot. I'm tempted to suggest that one of the underlying themes of this symposium, namely the sparse documentation of British performance work in the decade, is partly explained by the mixture of disdain and indifference with which the period in general is viewed. The 70s has somehow become the Dark Ages. There was certainly something <coughs> quite unsettling going on in the world of 70s fashion, and it's worth taking a look at, not just for a thoroughly justified easy laugh, but in order to see if it has some of the qualities of a vanguard tendency that would align in some way with the fraught and dramatic politics of the era. And I should warn some members of the audience uh, may find these images disturbing. <laughs> it's worth bearing in mind that flares for men are a way of wearing a skirt on each leg. <laughs> they offer a departure from the straight trousers of conventional men and a, and a sensation of freedom below the knee that is usually restricted to women. Here's a few more. Um, what we seem to be seeing, despite the mild horror that often accompanies our appraisal of garments from this period, is a quite aggressive assault on the hippie styles of the late 60s when, in men's fashion, there was a tendency towards feminization that produced in turn a hyperfeminization in female hippies. But in the same breath, another style of feminization for men is taking place, or taking hold, in the 70s fashions. The hair is restyled, often horribly. The flowers are subtracted. The result is more conventionally legible. It's a masculinized feminization. The earlier 60s flamboyance was too much for an era when living conditions were clearly nothing like the utopian visions of the love generation. But showiness and ostentation has not receded. To some extent, 70s fashion would reconstitute men as men by means of hyper-male facial hair, for example, 
and women as women with the aid in the early 70s of hot pants. This doesn't of course cover the whole spectrum. It was also in the early 70s that glam rock emerged, taking out the androgyny of the hippies and ushering in possibilities of experimentation with gender that would endure for decades to follow. So, um, that was a quick um, fashion-based scamper through some of the extremely conflicting tendencies apparent throughout the 70s, tendencies that can be detected even in the details of high street fashion. Often regarded as a monotone repost to the delirious 60s and a pale precursor to the rise of rave and the consolidation of Thatcherism, the 70s were laced with tensions, some of which would be expressed in the emergence of a wide range of non-theatre-based performance around the UK. I want to move now from a background sketch to an account that is entirely personal, drawing on recollections of the occasions that Lumiere and Sun Theatre Company, that's the one co-directed by Hilary Westlake and myself, um, performed in Bath at the invitation of the Bath Arts Workshop. I, um, it was, of course, in the late 60s and early 70s that the Bath Arts Workshop, in its close alliance with the Natural Theatre of Bath, rose to impressive heights as both practitioners and sponsors of a body of life performance work, work that almost without exception was mounted in non-theatrical public spaces across what was and is an elegant and conservative English heritage city. This was the world in which the underdocumented Lumiere and Sun Theatre Company found itself in 1973 when we started touring. It was, a, it was as if this august city, its parks and crescents and waterfalls, had been seized in the night by affable vandals specialling in the redistribution of pomp amongst those of lesser circumstance. I'd been aware that there was an alternative scene somewhere in the city, but where did they live? Every house was posh. Every street was a postcard. Plus, the city already had an annual festival. The pro programmers for which, so we believed, would, would regard our work with the disdain normally reserved for a dead dog in a swimming pool. We found that they were everywhere our hosts. While they seemed not to have actual houses, they could act readily be found down a lane off Walcott Street in the organ factory their bustling office and rehearsal space with fine views of hills and canals. If not in the HQ, they'd be in halls, requisitioned for canteens, looking at lists of places to crash in pubs full of long-haired youth in boots, scurrying across the bridges, chopping vegetables, writing menus, everyone doing many jobs, a shadow cabinet. And then, on the same day, some of them, ones we'd seen earlier elsewhere, transformed in the street, in theatrical makeup, parading the passageways with handbills and handbags. In 1976, which was our fourth visit to the Bath Arts Workshop Festivals, Lumiere and Son decided to present a number of events in paramilitary uniform. We wore white one-piece suits with black belts, boots, gaiters, helmets and veils, and determined that we would exude a cold, precise menace tempered with an absurdity that belied the hostile manner. Our hosts found us a rehearsal space in the Bell, where we drilled and marched and devised performances that were variously unpleasant, silly and enigmatic. The festival opened with a parade, and knowing that our hosts could find us just about anything we asked for, we requested a number of human babies and some black fire extinguishers. Our hosts approached some mothers who knew the extent to which in real life we loved animals and plants, and they lent us their swaddled infants. Most of the babies were returned, <laughs> but one troop member gave back a fire extinguisher and kept the child. He soon realised his mistake and, of course, apologised profusely. One evening, we decided to menace the hat and feather pup we were pleased to discover that we had to do very little to make our presence felt and could simply sit at tables drinking somberly and laughing amongst ourselves. It is true, however, that at one point one of our troops was, a, was approached by a hippie girl wishing to, dis, to spread what she described as love. Colette, our 
one of our troop members, spat in her face. I should say, that's what I'm supposed to say, and I'm not proud of that now, but I won't say that. Um, after leaving the pub, we crossed the road and stood silently and still in line abreast, sometimes slapping our right thighs with our palms. So as people left the um, hat and feather, they'd see this uh, augury of things to come. According to Cruz, a founder member, as you well know, of the Bath Arts Workshop and a natural theatre stalwart, whose presence along with John Bull puncture request repair kits, Mick Banks, is a much missed today. They, are, they had to be somewhere else doing something important, or else they would have come, they assure me. Um, uh, their presence is much missed as they ply their long-running British events. Um, and Corinne wrote this account of our next exploit from her essay on Bath Arts Workshop and the 1970s festivals in Bath, which I'm sure you can get your hands on. She said, I think, all the I think the artists all appreciated the special atmosphere those festivals engendered, one which enabled, nay, encouraged artists to push the outside of the envelope. And Lumiere and Son did just that. Strange and unexplained, their special forces, that's the paramilitary thing, comprised a lineup of identically dressed and drilled performers, all black and white and paramilitary. From their encampment on the festival site, they would spill forth in military precision on spontaneous and unannounced forays all over the city, spreading an atmosphere of menace instantly picked up on by audiences who might well have known something about police harassment. Booted and boiler suited, they were real hardcore. They didn't balk at anything. One night, staging an after-dark guerrilla operation to raid the overflowing Hat and Feather pub. Then, one twilight evening, they stepped into the River Avon and lined up stock still and ankle deep in water on the V-shaped edge of Pulteney Weir. It was a shockingly powerful live image which captivated the imagination but defied explanation, not to mention the police. The local constabulary, too hesitant to enter the water, had to wait till the performers were confident that they'd satisfied their milling public before they were able to reprimand them. That was written uh, by Corinne. And I should add that when we retired from the weir, the police said, why were you doing that? And we said, it's art. And they said, don't do it again. <laughs> we did, however, uh, as a stage show, directed and choreographed by Hilary, Hilary Westlake, a few months later, but that's not an outdoor art, so we'll move on. In the vacant house that was our lodging was a no number of itinerant performers, most of whose work was peculiar, that being the default taste of the Bath Arts Workshop. Our hosts, we had long come to realise, were arty. And in those days, community theatre, as it was then called and funded, was rarely arty. The sketchily documented Kipper Kids on our corridor were certainly arty, but not in a nice way, which is not to say they were not arresting, entertaining even, in a bracing way. One of them, the one that didn't go on to marry Bette Midler in uh, 1984, which means it was Harry Kipper, not his brother Harry Kipper, I think, had this thing where you, when you said hello to him, quite a harmless greeting, really, um, he would blow a raspberry. Not only that, he would intersperse an otherwise curt but intelligible response to anything in particular with sharp raspberries scattered randomly across his sentences. When I said to him, are you going to your shop today, for example, he said, yeah, <coughs> we might be doing that, yeah. <coughs> Um, I should add that Bette Midler famously said of her marriage to Martin von Hasselberg, I married a German. Every night I dress up as Poland and he invades me. <laughs> and here they are, knobs out, with them um, and Bean. The Kippers had requested a shop front, so the Bath Arts Workshop, of course, gave them one beneath their office in Walcott Street. One sunny morning, I was walking down Walcott Street thinking, yes, this city is mine. And I noticed as I passed the shop front that one of the windows beside the door had been filled with torn up paper all the way up to the ceiling. Oh, goody, 
That will be an installation by one of the many unusual performers performing here, I said to myself. I drew level with the window and studied it closely. At first it seemed that what you saw was what you got. Then I noticed some movement. The paper scraps were shifting about. I bent down that I might improve my sight line and I saw a length of knob with two hairy bollocks beneath it. <laughs> I suppose it's rather like those episodes in folklore where a person is going down a lane and they see a sprite in the hedgerow, but it is gone in a trice. Um, just to sort of rub home a point, 45 years later there is indeed documentation of the Clipper Kids, quite rightly, Dominic Johnson's book, uh, Unlimited Action, the performance of extremity in the 70s. Only took 45 years. It's not, it's our fault, because we're a load of hippies, yeah? We thought, what's documentation now? We're just doing it, yeah? Oh, what, and who's going to fucking, like, write it down or something? <laughs> that was the attitude, I'm afraid. Uh, but Dominic got there, nice young chap. Anyway, um, <coughs> anyway, uh, the knob receded. I walked on, greatly uplifted. The city was ours. The shadow cabinet had taken the reins. We'd occupied the streets and we can get shop fronts and by extension just about anything, just by asking. If the impact of Harry Kipper's tackle was not a source of exhilaration for all, there were some acts on the street that showed such complete mastery of the urban ambulatory style that flocks of passers-by were routinely entranced. One of the two most ingenious pieces was film crew by the legendary and under-documented John Bull Puncher repair kit. The lanky Mick Banks, the stout Al Beach, the balding John Darling, the bewhiskered Dis Willis, Dis Willis and the compact George O'Brien had been immersed in the British surrealism of bric-a-brac ritual and bluff non sequitur for a while and shared comic skills that could be detected at a distance of 100 yards as I hope to demonstrate. Now, no it isn't. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, this slide, if you look in the distance, you see that the um, at street level, as it were, uh, completely uh, surrounded by crowds and um, the bridge was full of crowds and they were visible from all those uh, raised viewpoints and ones on the same level. The film crew usually comprised a director, a cameraman, an actor or two, a stunt man, perhaps a dolly grip, should circumstance require him. The boom mic was a loofah suspended from a bamboo cane. The tripod had mannequin's legs and the camera was artfully, artfully constructed from two round biscuit tins fixed to a box. The film crew was in a position, A, to claim that it was making a film, B, to point out that scenes in films are generally shot out of order, and C, to select any location that struck them as in any way promising. An inspired formula, they could go anywhere. They could shoot close-ups, which bunched them. They could set up for a long shot with the crew on one side of Parade Gardens and the actors in the middle distance. And in case the spectators focused too much on the crew, <coughs> the director, invariably a petulant creature in jodhpurs, would use the megaphone to bark at the, hap the hapless cast. The spectators were thereby stitched into the whole picture, the whole wide tableau, and could stand as close or as far away from its components as they wished. It was big, it was detailed, it went on for hours, and it was increasingly and unceasingly, I, sh I meant to say unceasingly, inventive. Who can forget the towering beanpole banks sporting a dashing white Panama and a glistening white shirt cut from cardboard, languidly descending the steps into parade gardens over and over, attempting each time to synchronise his passing by a gigantic ornamental urn with the props man who, hidden on its far side, would lunge forward, extending a stick bearing a banana on a string so that the fruit would appear in the periphery of the star's vision, startling him. Either the star or the props man would mistime the encounter, leading to endless retakes. The director, I recall, yelled apoplectically at his charges, you go down the steps, you see the banana, it startles you, and you brush it away, you brush it away. 
And then you'd walk back into town, perhaps with a view to getting one in at the hat and feather, and you would, on this particular day at any rate, stop for a moment to watch a strange uh, procession, flanked by two bewigged and knickerbockered flunkies, propelled by a third, all three carved in white stockings, that's carved as in L-C-A-L-V, um, to watch a strange procession. Oh, I've, well, I've already said that. Um, there is a stately Georgian lady in a wheelchair. She has a rug over her knees and carries a carved wooden box in her lap. From time to time, she issues querulous instructions to her retinue, and then, as a crowd draws in, she brings the wheelchair to a halt with a wave of her hand. And what happens next deserves registration in the canon of European street theatre. We should note that the integration of high production values and astonishing ingenuity marks this piece as typical early period work by the natural theatre, setting as ever a very high bar for subsequent aspirants to the utter uppermost leagues of the street. The lady asks her audience if they'd like to, she, to see what she has in her box. She is by now encircled. Children have been pushed to the front, for surely this will be delightful. She says she will open it for them. Taking her time, she carefully lifts the lid and allows it to rest upon her skirts. There, set in a bed of blue velvet, is a tiny little face with two bright eyes and full red lips. It's no bigger than half an orange. A murmur of enchantment ripples through the crowd. The lips part, a tongue slides out and is withdrawn. As one, the crowd steps back. There are cries of horror and alarm. Health and safety issues momentarily arise. Their regulation, however, not to be enshrined in law until 1974, fortunately. As rugged members of the public spill onto the road, screaming and gathering unto them their children. A mesmerised silence descends, broken only by muttered mansplaining. The term was yet to be coined. From those anxious to regain their dignity after shrieking incontinently. Slowly and with great care, the crowd inches back towards the wheelchair. The lady, unperturbed, <coughs> smiles pleasantly as the mouth in the box puckers and makes <coughs> kissing noises. Even as the crowd squeals and squeals again, the lid of the box is lowered and the retinue continues its grand passage up the street, leaving 30 passers-by enveloped in a cloud of amazement. Further up the road, a sweating performer, entombed in the coffin-like compartment concealed beneath the lady's ample bottom, would be eased out of his or her cramped quarters and, I expect, given a nice glass of water as they remove the makeup from their chin and lips. <coughs> so all the work I've described took place in one of the most supportive contexts I've worked in over the last 45 years. I'm 47, by the way. Um, the Bath Arts Work Festivals were a model of creative hospitality that involved not just programming, but creating, as a result of their tireless commitment to the community and to visiting artists, what felt like a borderless civic performance space in which purveyors of outdoor arts were only expected to be visible, matters of time, location and duration were left to the practitioners, who, as a result, could choose where to go, when to do it and what to do. The work grew from gig to gig, rather than being restricted to home HQ, and it demonstrated that the programmers could be patrons, producers and innovators. Lumiere and Son, now co-directed co by Hilary Westlake and myself, its membership enlarged and driving in a bigger van, returned several times to the Bath Arts Workshop summer festivals, often to the streets, and once or twice to indoor spaces, such as the Walcott Village Hall. Emboldened by our sense that we had the freedom of the city and the support of some of its more adventurous citizens, Hilary and I would say things to each other like, do you think we could ever do this? And the other one would say, of course, we can do it in Bath. Thank you. Now this is mainly, um, this, this, uh, this group is, is firstly, how did we end up working outdoors and for free. Um, I mean, just to kick it off, I would say from my experience, because we could, we actually could, the flimsiest of ideas could be tried out 
and found substance in front of an audience. Um, because we were undocumented, nobody really cared what we did. You know, the work that was done, I, people were either amused at or appalled. Um, so there was a huge freedom um, in those early, early days. And places um, like the Oval House in London, where you'd be given space to rehearse, mostly indoor work, has to be said, but not exclusively, was Liberty Hall. You could do whatever. And then coming down to the Bath Festival was also Liberty Hall. You could, you, you had enormous freedom to, to to perform what you wanted anywhere. So let me pass over to um, to, to some of the panel. Um, how would you say that we started? Um, how did this work? Me. Any of you? Any of you? If, if you indicate with your eyes, who'd like to start? Um, you know, how, how did this work start? How? What was the pleasures of working outdoors? And uh, I think initially it was free until the Arts Council managed to categorise it. Because I think in our early days they gave us a little tiny bit of money that we could sort of do what we want with. Um, until the area was actually categorised and a fund was created for it. And then, um, then it became a bit different, so there were boxes we had to take. But before that, how do you think um, this, this, this scene, this area started? Um, I'm not entirely sure how it started, but before, just, just before we go on, I mean, you, you mentioned this wonderful show of the Lady in the Box. Yes. The Lady in the Box never got any, um, uh, never really got any applause, so I think we can give the Lady in the Box a bit of applause because she's right here. Jackie, if you could stand up a moment. Hey. The Lady in the Box was one of the most extraordinary bits of theatre that, and, and that I first saw when I first came to Bath, and Ralph used to be sitting in the, in the big wheelchair and Jackie would be squeezed into an incredibly and tidy Andrew, space. And Andrew, and Andrew as well. And Andrew as well. Yes, of course, I forgot that. Hello, Andrew. Um, and uh, it, much <coughs> terrible discomfort, and used to come out of under, underneath the wheelchair in a great deal of pain, so the art was worth the pain. Um, how did we start with the outdoor stuff? I, did, I was in Edinburgh at the time, this was all going on, with a company called Edinburgh, uh, the Edinburgh Combination, and we were doing very, very similar things to what was happening in Bath, funnily enough. Um, and uh, we hosted many, many theatre companies. I, I don't know if you came, but we certainly had the People Show and various other companies of that period. I'm talking sort of uh, 68, 69, 1970 at the time, before I left Edinburgh to go to London. And of course, in those days, we, we were all young and we were all students and we had no responsibilities. And so it was easy to do uh, stuff for free because we wanted to. And that's really what happened. It, we, it, was, it was born Working for nothing was born of a passion just to perform and to get our crazy ideas out to the public. Um, it then came one of those things, of course, that you know we went on and we all had children and then the responsibilities and um, uh, required payment for it. But to do stuff for free was, was, was part of, I think, a, a motivation of youth as much as anything else. It was a, a desperate desire to, to break the moulds of straight performance art as it was there on stage at that time. Um, in fact, you mentioned the Kipper Kids. Um, I little, it's little known that I was actually a member of the Kipper Kids at one time because they started at East 15 Drama School where I was, and Martin and Brian were very, very crazy guys who didn't want a game to do the straight performances and go on to be straight, highly paid actors. They wanted to do something different. Um, and in fact, I think one of the first performances they ever did, the only line in it, it was sitting, the two of them sitting in a taxi with their faces lit by a uh, light from the inside was. I was then known, not as Paul Pavel Douglas, which is my stage name, but it's Paul Douglas. They were, the only line in the entire performance was, what would Paul Douglas say? <laughs> what would Paul Douglas say? <laughs> what would Paul Douglas say? <laughs> and that, it went on for about half an hour. So, you know, whether you liked it or not, people came and went, and the line continued. So they'd heard it before they carried on hearing it. But the Kippers went on to do many other things, and I don't know if they're still around, if they're still performing. I think the Martins independently were the thing that helps. And so, yeah, so here we are. and. Uh, I remember being in London, trying to get an Arts Council grant to put on some theatre, to put on some outdoor shows. And that was when I heard about uh, Bath Arts Workshop on Natural Theatre. And so came to Bath in, in, in 75, 76, and everyone was doing it for free. And it, doing it for free gave one an enormous freedom to do stuff, because you weren't bound by the constraints of having to be responsible to, to your paymaster to actually do what they wanted. You could do what you wanted yourself. And working in the street was a wonderful space because 
it gave you the opportunity to just to do whatever you wanted and to be as shocking as you wanted because um, there was no one really to give you a hard time about it except maybe the local police force. Okay. Um, I joined the Bath Arts Workshop in 1971. I followed my girlfriend down from Nottingham to Bath and she was the first person to be paid by the Bath Arts Workshop. She became the secretary for the BAW. Uh, she earned six pounds a week. That was the first wage. Uh, I remember the, the, the rest of the workshop got paid eventually. And again, the first wage was eight pounds a week. Uh, and it went up to 12 pounds a week. But with that amount of money, you could live quite happily. It seemed a, quite a generous wage at the time. Uh, there was a commun communality about Bath Arts Workshop and I think the key word for me probably is the word community because it was also called, it was the Bath Arts Workshop but it was also uh, a pioneer of community arts. It was the Bath Arts Workshop, the Bath Arts Community Arts Workshop in fact and I think the, the idea of the street theatre is to do with the idea of a community. That's where the audience was the community of Bath or was the community of the places where you visited and performed. It's almost like a, a modern version of the Commedia dell'arte companies turning up and playing for the populace, the people who are in the street, the people who are going around their ordinary everyday business. And I think also there's something about the, the legacy of those companies. I mean, it's not exclusive that people came from different backgrounds. Pat talked about East 15. There's quite a lot of uh, art college influence on those early companies. Um, I mean, I worked with Roland Thomas there. And Roland and I set up Exploded Eye in the 70s. And Roland's background was uh, art college. Uh, John Fox, Welfare State, there was a an art college influence there. Um, Soft Soap from Leeds were art college students. Uh, and I think because there was that element of the art college students who were interested in live performance, they wouldn't necessarily think about going to a theatre to perform. That wouldn't be the first starting off point for them because they were art students who wanted to do live art. So anywhere could be a performance space. So. I think for me that was probably why uh, I think there was a big uh, impetus in terms of street arts from the, the, the art college students who founded these companies, I mean not, not exclusively, uh, but it was, that's where the audience was, it was trying to do performance of people who were your ordinary citizen, which was part of the, the whole idea of the, uh, what the Bath Arts Workshop was about. And of course there's a tremendous legacy in terms of companies who are still practicing. Uh, I mean, we have uh, Johnny B from the Desperate Man who's sitting in the audience, who was also working as a member of Crystal Theatre of the Saint in Bristol. Uh, John and I would see each other quite often on the circuit because I formed another company called Original Mixture. And uh, there's another representative here from The Curious theatre company, Curious Company. These were new companies that got, were inspired, in my case inspired from, by the Natural Theatre Company and by Exploded Eye. Uh, Johnny and I also worked together on um, a circus show when I was head of performance at Circus Space. We did a, a community, a, well it wasn't a community circus show, it was a sort of aesthetic circus show. Uh, again, we were interested in popular forms like circus, commedia dell'arte, clown, these were the popular forms of the street. So for me, all those influences plus the art college and everything else meant you propelled to uh, unusual spaces. And the legacy carries on. Uh, there's, there's, an, there's an MA now in uh, site-specific performance at, uh, uh, at uh, Mountain View Drama School in London. And it's run by a woman called Geraldine Pilgrim, who set up, or was a founding member of Hesitate and Demonstrate, who are a company again from the 70s who played the Bath Arts Workshop festivals. Uh, so there's a new group of students who are now investigating working in unusual places with their roots firmly in this kind of era. So the work is carrying on spreading and disseminating. Uh, 
because um, there was a, a, they were going to build a tunnel through Bath. And we said, why not go and do a demonstration? Instead of a demonstration, Ralph, dressed up as a housewife, living in a cardboard uh, home, and we all arrived as people on, uh, in little cardboard cars, hooting to get through the tunnel. And that was the first piece of street stuff I'd ever done. I mean, before that, I think they had a few uh, children's show that they used to all bundle into a post office telephone span and trundle around the country doing a little claim show. But that was when the street theatre, the first thing we did was the protest about the Buchanan Tunnel. And Ralph was fantastic. And um, as long as you don't cut my accent strap, I don't mind. You know. Jack, will you pull the chair up? Pull the chair, pull the chair up. We've got. Yeah, yeah. I can encourage Jackie to pull a chair up, which is so sure we've got hundreds of more stories. Well, she can come. She, she can misinterpreted come your invitation. What's that? She misinterpreted. No, she didn't. No, she didn't. Good. Beg <laughs> <laughs> your pardon. Beg your pardon. <laughs> should also point out that at the time Jackie was uh, with a lovely chap called Brian Pope, who many of you know and love or hate, it's up to you, um, <laughs> um, who sadly can't be with us today, but he again came from an art school background. And I think that his first appearance in, uh, in that, to do with natural theatre was he turned up wearing a bowler hat carrying an orange, and that was his performance. So we were all we all came really from a slightly surreal background. Dave, do you want to say before we go to the audience? Do you want to say anything to say? I'm okay. set out. Okay. Um, uh, members of the audience, uh, have you got anything to say? I'm sure it's a bit like have. question time. This look. look. Um, just uh, particularly, what, what, what effect do you think the fact that the work was outdoor and free, what freedom did that give your imagination, your practice, um, not only at that time, but how work you've done subsequent, subsequent to that? Um, uh, because not everybody has stayed outdoors, I'm sure uh, a lot of people have done work indoors as well. Uh, does anybody have anything that they would like to say on that? Well, I think it was all about disruption. It was about the freedom to sort of um, disrupt the normal fabric of day-to-day -day life, really, to sort of um, do extraordinary things uh, without any comeback, really. You could get away with anything, because it was kind of extraordinary. Nobody, nobody came along and said, you can't do that. Or if they did, you'd just walk away. <laughs> I mean, um, I don't know. Um, these days, though, I think that I find street theatre, um, as it used to be called, we now have to call it outdoor arts, um, but street theatre, I think, is, is pretty irrelevant unless it's got something to do with civil disobedience or direct action, and I think that's where it's gone now, thinking about contemporary stuff. It's all about Extinction Rebellion, and that's where it's all gone to, and it's become the norm to dress up and have a samba band and put on funny clothes and all the rest of it. And the, um, the Red Rebel Brigades that came from Invisible Circus in Bristol have now gone worldwide. This, this image of, of people dressed in red that's um, become part of the Extinction Rebellion movement. And I think that's fantastic. So that's, that's a, a legacy. Um, I don't know what else to say. Okay. Okay, well, Anybody else? I think when it began it was very easy to be noticed. When you walk down the street with a with something on your head, everyone would turn around and look at you now. Yeah. I think that's very true of Peter. I don't know if anybody's been to Shambhala Festival um, and everybody dresses up. So we went there to do a gig and said, well, we'll put on these funny costumes. But of course, we just completely disappeared because everybody's in a funny costume. So, so now it's just the norm for everybody to dress up. You know. To do that. Yeah. If, if yeah. you've got a fur, we just go, why don't we all go and get some fancy dress? And then we'll all go, no, look at fur. Yeah. And you'd arrive and your costume is probably inferior to some, well, not always, but. 
But it keeps you guessing, which is quite nice. It makes it immersive. So if you're a member of the public and you don't quite know, if you're a member of the public and you don't quite know who's performing and who isn't, especially at festivals, it's great because you, yeah, it, yeah keeps you guessing, and so you can, it, it, it adds a bit of suspicion as well in all your interactions, which is quite nice if you're in that environment. It keeps you on edge. That's pretty cool, I think. Yeah. Um, for me, it's about making connections with strangers. Um, one of the privileges of uh, working in the street in this kind of way is you get to talk to or at people you've never met before without the normal confines of social norms like introducing yourself by name or <coughs> being introduced by someone else. So you can have um, incredibly intimate and private moments with complete strangers um, pl quite playful moments in a way which I certainly really appreciate and hopefully they do too. Um, I think it's one of the, the great takeaways whether you're paid or not you get this kind of going home present of having had this connection or an experience with a complete stranger and you never know where it's going to go. You might have a plan as a performer where you want to take it, but it, you know, it, it could go anywhere. You don't know who this person is. They might, um, they might love it. They might hate it. They might have an idea of their own. But for me, there's a certain freedom of expression which um, I'm only part of it, and um, it's it's always an adventure. You never know where it's going to go. Um, I don't want to sound impertinent but here, but do you, or what do you think is your responsibility to your audience? Because it seems to me as though you've been talking a great deal about your intentions. I wonder what you thought your responsibility was to the people who were in the audience. Well, not to traumatise them, but to take them close. Mm. Okay. Um, it, it, should, it should have some traumatic impact, but not in a uh, destructive way. Insofar as it should be startling, unusual. We can distinguish between street or outdoor arts which are spectacular. You simply stand there and it's very obvious that it's a show. But then there's a whole other kind of strand of people who blended in and who dressed fairly close to what people in the street were wearing, like wearing suits, for example, slightly smarter than the average street wear, but nevertheless, um, not exactly, um, you know, it wasn't sequins or anything. Uh, and I think that both of those have their, um, their shocking potential. So I think shocking is a bit too strong, startling potential. And people got, um, people were by no means always delighted. Um, any street performer will tell you that they've been um, pushed, sworn at, um, punched, hit. Um, people have come up and I did a thing on my own in Edinburgh and I had a, a small hat to take some money and the young woman took it. <laughs> and because I was so profoundly in character, I couldn't get back. <laughs> um, and that, and there was enough there for several drinks that evening, I remember, because a drink only cost a penny then. And you could take a woman out for two and six, have a slap up meal, go to a show then, take a cab home, stopping off at the station en route to weigh yourselves. And you still have tuppence left. You get a car for five quid. <coughs> In those days. Uh, sorry, yes, I diverged there from what I was talking about, which I've forgotten. But that is one of the prices one pays for living it to the limits, over long. And now I can look back fondly, now that I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> This, and the, the candle is guttering. <laughs> we can still move forward whilst looking back. As I'll stop now. Paul, perhaps you have something to say? I'll take uh, just something, and then I'll hand it back to you. Um, I think one of the things about the audience, it has changed, because in the early days, as has been mentioned several times, we were undocumented. We were large, I mean, the audience could be amused, appalled, whatever, and say they shouldn't, get, shouldn't be allowed, but the press had no interest. There wasn't funding sections. I think once press 
marketing, I mean, ma who'd heard of marketing in the old days? You know, now there's marketing and people are interested, the marketers, marketeers want to know who, who is this for. The thought <coughs> of who you're uh, uh, um, performing and creating for is now right at the top. Um, people are offended these days. People would be offended, but it wasn't officially. I mean, people get offended very easily now. I mean, in the old days, one wanted to be offensive. I mean, reviews that we had a review where say even Rab Rabelais would make an excuse and left. Um, that was such a good thing, which we put in our publicity. We possibly wouldn't today, because um, certainly I lost some work because people thought I was a sex fiend. Um, but um, I think the thing about the audience is that clearly, when you if you look at theatre, site-specific theatre, outdoor arts, they're sort of blending a bit. Whereas before they were the theatre anywhere, the theatre um, that was indoor. Or, um, it was quite different to street theatre. Um, but now I think there's a huge consideration about audience experience. I don't know if people have found this. Um, age group, language, not only accessibility, not only so that, that it's a, you know, family friendly, what a horrible term. Um, you know, this is on a lot of publicity, this is a family friendly show. And already you know that it, in some way, people have made concessions that many years ago they wouldn't have made, but that, that work would equally have been family friendly, everybody would have enjoyed it. But somehow now there is a consideration um, in your funding, in your marketing, in your people booking you, they want to know exactly who you're aiming for, if it's absolutely acceptable. Um, and I think that's a, a regrettable development. Mm. Hillary makes, I'll come to you, John. Hillary makes an interesting point about the audience thing there. Um, it's as much as defining what is performed as defining what is audience. Um, doing street theatre or doing theatre outdoors is a very interesting concept because normally speaking, an audience chooses to and then pays to go and see a performance. Whereas in what we have been doing for the last couple of years is to actually take the performance to said audience, whether they like it or not. And that is a, it's quite an interesting sort of uh, philosophical sort of angle to take. Um, also, the thing about uh, whether whether the, that performance is implicit or understated, in, in as much as I mean, in the forty plus years that I've been in the natural theatre, we began by being very visible, then being very natural and almost invisible, so that people didn't really weren't really sure whether it was a performance or whether it was just something happening in their midst that they they couldn't put their finger on to now becoming a performance again. And so that shape has changed. And I think that many theatre companies are doing, doing that too. Um, originally, back in Edinburgh, I was with a company called the Anonymous Theatre Company. And again, we performed, uh, you probably even didn't know, but we came to Bristol when Crystal Theatre were performing. We performed there, but no one knew who we were. We even had business cards with a with silver card with Anonymous Theatre Company on it, but if you rub the letters, they disappear. <laughs> so that, that was that kind of, we would just do a performance, and no one was even sure whether it was a performance. So that was very, very, very subtle. And, uh, yep. I used to love the Crystal Theatre. Uh, I didn't see them enough. Uh, but um, they did one of the most memorable performances that I've ever seen, insofar as, I don't know if they would look back and say that from their point of view it was necessarily a success. <clears throat> it uh, was in one of those extremely uh, permissive and welcoming uh, Amsterdam-based theatres, the Mickey, the Mickery, or um, not the Mickey, Mickey uh, the Mickery, or possibly the um, Mandalay, um, <coughs> well attended, and the Crystal Theatre had erected a large scaffolding pyramid. I was in, in that show. You did that show. I did that. It was the Shaffy. Shaffy. Thank, thank you. Yeah. yeah. That's the punchline. Um, and uh, well, fair enough, fair enough. No, 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 I'll build it up. And um, it was going well. Uh, and uh, on the py pyramid, there are at least three uh, platforms. I think the musicians, probably being the heaviest, were on the, the, the lowest and largest platform. But other people could access higher platforms. And there are all kinds of amazing and excellent effects and uh, um, inscrutable and um, surreal kind of vignettes and passages and um, sequences. 
uh, the, 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 muse the, musicians, the musicians whose speakers were on the platform, I believe, uh, uh, as well, would uh, accompany all this. And, and then there became and this sort of Aboriginal um, drone noise started to fill the auditorium. He said, oh, that's quite a good noise. And then a strange screaming, groaning sound got louder and louder. And then slowly, and almost horribly in a way, the um, pyramid began to splay at the bottom. And then the very heavy speakers and musicians spilled off onto the floor, with a lot of buzzing, crackling and snapping, shouts from the technicians, as the next um, tier up began to fall onto the floor. The thing was flattening all the time. I thought, this is amazing. <laughs> this is, I didn't know what was going on, nobody did. Possibly, well, I think you knew that it was wrong, because you probably discussed it beforehand. Uh, in, a, for, in a way that you regarded as right. Anyway, it was a total and utter catastrophe. There's just a bunch of mangled scaffolding. And what was missing from the scaffolding, I was told, were, what are they called? The end plates. If you look at uh, the scaffolding outside buildings, there is a, um, there's always a, a metal square with a thing up it which the scaffolding sits on. I think that's called an end plate, and it stops scaffolding skidding, but not on this occasion. Well, I can add to that story if you want to know more about yes, the story. Um, I was on top of it. It was a big scaffolding pyramid. There was a drum kit there. I had a Fender Rhodes piano with the big speakers underneath it, so a huge wadge of stuff. It was covered in wires electric cables everywhere all around the place drum kit guitar amps two guitar amps i think drum kit big piano um and the reason it fell was because uh, so you've got a pyramid and you've got bars across the bottom and the performers didn't like the bar that was across the front because they kept tripping over it <laughs> so they took it out <laughs> So they took out this bar that was at the front, and that's when the front two legs suddenly went like that and started sliding forward. I don't know how they dislocated. I don't think there was ones at the back or something. I don't know. But it was a slow motion collapse made all the more extraordinary because um, there, there was a scene. We had uh, fluorescent tubes hanging down from the middle of the scaffolding, so it was all lit by vertical fluorescent lights. And there was a point where... We had a huge jug of rice and somebody was underneath with an umbrella and the, and the rice was poured onto the umbrella. Lovely effect, I think probably in strobes or something, I don't know. So when this <laughs> collapsed, there was this great smash of this big china jug full of rice and rice everywhere, <laughs> along with everybody, everything else. It was a miracle nobody got killed. We could have all got electrocuted. Um, it was an extraordinary moment. And the audience just sat there going, Wow, this is amazing. <laughs> what, how did they do that? You know, until a certain point where we all hit the floor and then, you know, and people were kind of jumping out of the way or trying not to get their legs trapped. Yeah. And then I remember after that, the two front legs of scaffolding, these proper scaffolding poles, were completely bent to sort of 45 degrees. And we had to get them back on the truck or the coach the next day, so we had to straighten them. <laughs> So we went outside the chaffee and there's those bars along the front of the canals that stop the cars going into the thing. So we put in this scaffolding pole under these things, trying to wrench this scaffolding pole down straight so we could get it on top of the van. Oh dear, those were the days. It was, a, it was an extraordinary moment. But Crystal Theatre were, were extraordinary. Uh, Paul Davis is still um, working and writing for Radio 4 and so I learnt a lot from them and took that into uh, subsequent work, I guess. It's interesting, isn't it, how much more difficult it is today to do what we do, because in the days when we were first doing it, there was nothing like it. And then by our being there and by our doing it, we seem somehow to give everyone, give the world permission to do what we were doing. And so now you have performances happening all around, and it becomes even harder than to have performances that stand out against, against what is going on, as it were, in the background. 
so so many places one where one goes to perform now, everyone is already dressed up. And every, I mean, I blame the Rocky Horror Show. Everyone <laughs> thinks that all you have to do is to dress like Frankenfurter, and then you're you know you can be a street star. But the the, the style of, of street theatre is very very hard to maintain, and to maintain if you like the ISP of your company. You know, we each each of our companies all had different styles of performance, different if, different ISPs. If this wonderful new new phrase that's come about, isn't it? Yes. Is it, what does USP. it stand for? Individual? Unique selling USP. Unique, unique, selling. unique. Oh, USP, not ISP. ISP is something to do with broadband. Um, USP. You, you, what? Unique something. Unique selling, unique selling point. point. There we are. I, you see, I say it glibly, and I don't even understand what it means. But so yeah, it's very, very, very difficult to 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 perform these days. And um, I think that well, one wonders if 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 that arc of street theatre has had its day. That's something we can discuss. Talking about USBs, um, I, uh, uh, for some peculiar reason, I got a job at Disneyland Paris. I was the um, artistic director of entertainment. Ridiculous, they gave me the job. Ridiculous, I took it. Um, but what I did notice when I came back from there, I was there just under three, three years, was the corporate corporatization of performance. So things like US, you would have to talk about unique, unique selling point. Nearly everywhere you went, you'd have to have a risk analysis, even when clearly there was, you were working in an empty room or an empty field with no, with nothing whatsoever. So I think that, that there was that, this is what's happened of, of late. And so it's, it, not only are there thousands of people training for performance, in many, many other, many, a whole variety of institutions. Um, uh, there is this great awareness of, of, of health and safety. And more and more as circus artists um, perform on the streets. Um, I mean, I, that's something I've done of late. I've worked with circus artists, circus trained artists who want to theatricalize their skills. Um, quite tricky often because they do have, they do have a skill and they don't want to, First thing to which early on we were discussing, we don't want to dilute them. Um, but it is more difficult to be as reckless as we were in the old days. It is more difficult. Um, and I think the question I'd like to put to everybody really is that clearly when you start off, you don't know anything. So you can do anything because you don't know anything. <coughs> and you're bold, you're young, you're cocky. Um, but then as you, as you keep doing stuff, you want to develop, you want to somehow structure your work a bit more, you want to give yourself challenges. And some, some people, I think, have been able to keep their challenges by being fairly spontaneous on the streets. I think others um, probably structure and f formalize their work a bit more. But as John was saying about that chap whose name I've forgotten, but just that what he writes is really surreal and extraordinary. Maybe that's because of how he started. How he started out. He started out in having the freedom to do that. So when he's moving into a more, let's say, conventional situation, he's brought that with with him. Um, so my question is: Would you, you know, because we're, um, you know, we're all fairly mature here, um, would you say that that ways that the baseline of doing this free work in the street has 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 allowed that as you've developed over the years it has given you a different approach to perhaps people who came from a less um adventurous and random route yes, <laughs> yes. Any more? <laughs> yes i think i think people are i think you know uh, younger performers doing doing street theatre at the moment are a bit inhibited actually and they think they have to hit a target or you know um they can't offend people they, they can't do anything that's too disturbing um because they do risk assessments and health and safety and all the rest of it so they're not going to take any risks with what they say or the content i, I mean I, I don't see an awful lot of street theatre these days but what i do see doesn't say anything to me. It's, there's no sort of content, and it's not about anything. It's like, oh, this is a show about you know two fairies meeting in the woods and trying to save the trees or something. And, but it's, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't work. There isn't that um, disturbing element. Also, I just want to go back to what you said about connecting with an audience, actually, because 
I think that's that's the thing that's central that doesn't change actually. Um, that one-to-one -one encounter with people, where you can have a very personal, private uh, moment with a, with a small group of people or with one individual, and you can be quite provocative and quite dangerous and and push the boundaries a bit because you're in a silly costume and they're not, sort of thing. So you can you can hide in your persona or your character and kind of push that envelope a little bit. And that's about psychology. It's about understanding your audience. You know, there's something about... I always have this thing of... Um, I can look somebody in the eye, look a member of the public in the eye, and within three seconds know whether they're up for playing or not. You can sort of gauge it really quickly. And I don't know how the hell you teach that. You, you know, it's a sort of understanding of your audience. And you were talking about family-friendly um, audiences, Hilary, and uh, your audience can be anybody. There can be two-year-olds and 70-year-olds and all social classes and a whole mix of people. So you have to do things that are hospitable to your audience. Uh, you can be offensive and, and push things a little bit, but you still have to kind of, you have to keep them with you. They're not paid to sit in a seat. You don't want to lose your audience completely. I mean, you can do, but mostly you want to keep people interested. So you, so the boundaries are quite... Um, fluid of, you know, how far can you push it before people walk away. And I think that hospitality to your audience is something that John Burgess said about his writing, being hospitable to the reader. Um, so I think there's something in that about making, being accessible at the same time as being able to be extraordinary, be a bit crazy, um, you know, push the boundaries, upset people, disturb things, disrupt the normal flow of, of shopping or whatever it is, wherever you happen to be. Um, but, but understanding your audience, understanding individuals and being able to talk to anybody, I think is, a, is, is one of the really basic skills that you, you hone over years, you know, that you can approach anybody and say, hi, I'm dressed as a red bunny rabbit or whatever it is, or I've got, I'm stuck to six pink suitcases or whatever, but you can, I don't know if you talk in the pink suitcases, but you know, you can, oh, yeah. we all certainly do, oh yeah, we well, break all the rules. And says, we're gonna go out there and nobody's, we're gonna be silent, and as soon as you go out there, you start talking to everybody. But I think that, you know, that, that connection with people is really, is really important. Um, if, um, always if, if I'm working with children, you always have that thing of, um, recognising people that really don't want to be played with. It's like the voyeurs that are behind the net curtains and they really want to watch you yeah. going up to you and going, oh, hello, you know, but you know that they don't want to be picked on at all. Um, and yeah, you do learn who, you know, who you're going to play with and they're going to be a child for four minutes. They're going to go back to being eight and you can have this really wonderful magic moment and then disappear. It's that's How different um, do you find it? I mean, what John said is that um, if you're part of a festival and there's a schedule and your work, your performance is starting at is, is time, so people come to see it, they're waiting for you to do it. Um, I mean, in other contexts, you have to you have to create your audience, you have to do a bunch of stuff in order to get an audience, and then you can kick off. And there's other stuff interventions. I don't know if they were called that in the old days, but where you just um, you do something, people come across you. You may keep them, you may not. Um, but they all seem to have a slightly dynamic. They all seem to give you a different sort of. Um, requirement about how you're actually going to going to perform w would you say that this is the case yes you have to create your audience or if your audience is coming coming to see see you well even even these even these days that um that that uh, in the way that buskers work they they, they have to have a pre-described pitch you're allowed a, a spot and a time slot so that it's it's become so regimented now everything seems to be Control. When when we were all starting out in street theatre, there was no control at all. That's why we were allowed to, to be a bit more agitprop, if you like, we're a bit more edgy, a bit more political. Now everything is to. I mean, even with natural theatre these days, we have a handbook of how to behave. You know, which is an extraordinary thing when you think about it. We street performers who were just 
were so anarchic and now uh, sort of you know restricted to how, how we should how we should perform. A very interesting thing that John mentioned about that thing that you know how 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 far do you push something, and that only comes from experience. If I may just 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 go sideways slightly. I mean, Recently, we, with the Natural Theatre, we've been asked to perform in the queues of people waiting to go into the pump rooms, to go into the Roman baths, just to entertain the queues while they're standing in line for 20 minutes. It's something that I resisted doing, but then I did it, and I actually got to love it, because you did this thing, it's this one-on-one -on -one thing, this being able to make a contact with one person. So your audience was one person, and then the periphery of the people around you. And then you have to gauge, how far do, you, how far do I, can I take this? And if I make do this little story about the character that I just invented, we do Georgians, as you know, but I invented a new Georgian. His name is Sir Hubert Fitzwilliam, and he's a he's a he's a very he's a bon vivant, very fat, and very he likes to drink Madeira. And you know, you talk to to Americans. Now Americans can, can be very easily offended, particularly these days. And most of the people that are in the queue are actually uh, Americans, or so certainly foreign. Are they all Republicans? Ah, well, this is the point. This is the point. And I worked out that they're not, because a they've got themselves a passport, which is very unusual for Americans. <laughs> Two, they've left America. They've actually got on a plane and gone out of the country. Three, they've come to England, okay, place of their forefathers. Four, they've come to Bath. That's pretty crazy, because it's a wonderful place. And five, they're going to a museum. Therefore, they're slightly more thinking than Republicans. And so you can actually say things to them like, yes, well, at the moment, I can't tell you. Uh, there's a chap uh, called Washington who's trying to, trying to drag you away from the clutches of British imperialism, helped by a Frenchman. <laughs> and by a few hundred years' time, an orange idiot will drag you back into the Dark Ages. And of course, they laugh because they've got a passport, they've left America, they've come to England, they've come to Bath, and they've come to a museum. So you know that you can get away with it. The, the, the trick then is to know that you can get away with it, because if you don't, you're going to get face punched. And um, that only comes from experience. I think there's also um, always a sense of risk taking in the early days. Uh, we certainly didn't have risk assessments. If you do a gig these days, yes, you have to fill in these uh, risk assessments, which are absurd for certain companies. I mean, I think for pyrotechnical companies, maybe there's a uh, that's maybe common sense, and you can understand why that needs to be done. But if you're working maybe with puppets in the street, and it's not really probably going to cause anybody a heart attack, hopefully. But um, the risk taking, was something that we always had, and I think that's also partly to do with the environment. You never quite knew what was going to happen. In a, in a theatre, you've got more sense of control, you've got the audience sitting down, you've got your stage. Yeah, when the streets are stage, anything can happen, it can be completely unpredictable. There is that sense of risk that gives a sense of excitement to what you're doing. Uh, I mean, for instance, when Roland and I did a, a midnight ballet dance outside Rotterdam Railway Station back in the 70s, uh, we had no sense of how that was going to pan out and we were just dropped by the station. We just came up with the idea of doing a bit of guerrilla theatre. Let's, let's do this ballet outside the Rotterdam railway station at midnight, let's see what happens. And we suddenly found this massive audience of taxi drivers who, basically all the taxi drivers there phoned up their mates and we got this massive <coughs> traffic jam of taxi drivers watching us, uh, and that came out of nowhere. I mean, the headline in the, uh, the, the, the Times of Holland was uh, theater for taxi drivers. So a new art form was created uh, very briefly and very temporary, it was a very temporary art form. I don't know whether it's ever carried on since, but, uh, uh, but that, you know, that was fantastic to sort of have that discovery of something unpredictable and I think with all the risk assessments and everything else, that sense of unpredictability is maybe not there quite so much. Uh, you know, just picking up what John said. Uh, so that's just a, a thought about risk and the permission to do that and the unpredictability and all these mysterious connections that can be created. Um, I'll pass it over today, but just to go back, um, to continue on from that, um, 
And I think we were saying in the old days there wasn't risk assessment, it was Liberty Hall. And I would say probably over the 80s, um, when the notion of health and safety came in and funding categories, so pe there was much more um, formal formalities that you had to um, subscribe to in order to get your money. But would you, are you aware of how that alter, did that alter your work or did everybody find ways around um, th those sort of requirements? Um, and would you not say that, okay, I, there's masses of very, very dull street theatre, very, very similar to each other, but is there not also the opportunity if you're going into the street and you're not being commissioned and you're not being funded to do the same sort of things we were talking about that people did in the 70s? Um, you may not be able to do it a lot, but there's nothing to stop you doing it for the first time, um, I, I would say. As long as you have public liability insurance. Oh yeah, public liability insurance, yeah. I'm, I'm afraid I'm off down memory lane again, talking, uh, when Mitch was talking about uh, risk taking. There's a, a, a very interesting instance of um, extreme risk taking uh, that took place in the, uh, the field behind Walcott Village Hall, what's it called, the burial field or something? Yeah, and that was the site of some festivals, an excellent site. Mr. Pugh's puppets uh, would visit that site, and uh, from a distance it looked like um, you know, a nice Punch and Judy shaped tent with a rather uh, good looking um, uh, chap uh, animating it, if you saw him, if he wasn't already in his tent. And um, the puppets were exquisitely handmade by Ted Milton, Mr. Pugh. And um, they, they had a kind of Bauhaus sort of quality to them. They were distinguished by the fact that they all had um, open round mouths with, that were tubular, that went into the head. And they also had very long noses. And mothers would take their children in uh, and they'd sit down and um, the kiddies would sit at the front, all very kind of classically um, constructed. And the <laughs> mums would stand at the back and, uh, you know, and other and whoever happened to be at the festival. Uh, and uh, it was fairly sort of okay for a minute or two, but then the most obscene things started to happen, mostly, ladies and gentlemen, when the puppets with the big noses fucked the other puppets in the head with their noses in the mouth. In front of these tiny children, who are probably even to this day in therapy, <laughs> or if they can't afford it because it's a middle class pursuit, um, suffering with all kinds of dermatological conditions and night panics and incontinence. And so there was that, a, an almost, not, I won't say sociopathic, but socially um, adventurous or experimental attitude towards the, the health and safety, safety of young people. But it wasn't, I think, and this may be apocryphal, um, I think it was 1974 when uh, health and safety was enshrined in law, and I think it was because um, a, a young woman was crushed to death at a David Bowie concert in Olympia. The, uh, she got pushed up against the barriers, and the, uh, it was all very wrongly, um, the, the audience was wrongly contained, there was no, nothing to stop a surge. At which point, the then possibly London County Council, whatever it was called then, did start to, you know, uh, clamp down. We can't have this kind of thing happening anymore. And it became more and more and more elaborate. There was a point uh, about five years ago when Hillary and I were commissioned to do a show at the Youth Music Theatre uh, in the Holloway Road. And um, fantastically talented young um, performers between the age of 10 and 20. And before we started, um, we were, every single member of our team was given a manual, uh, but possibly something like you described a moment ago. There was so much in this manual that it was actually perfect bound. You know, you have saddle stitch where you have a small number of play, uh, pages and they're held in place by two uh, staples. If you've got more than about 90 pages, it's uh, it's safer to go perfect bound, and that's when the magazine has a right angled spine. And it was absolutely full of things that we mustn't do. And the most impressive thing, and 
I think there's a tendency here to get a bit sort of um, curmudgeonly, and I think we, we have to kind of step through that because um, uh, I teach in a university and 85% uh, of whose students are young women, in the, uh, well, they're 18 or 19 when they enter, obviously, most of them. And there's a tremendous infrastructure now in universities to do with mental health and support, various types of support. This, um, going back to the youth music theatre, it was, there were many, many chaperones, professional people, not all women by any means, and the deal was that you should never be alone in a room with any of the uh, children, well, some of the 20. Uh, you should never touch them. I think the director would be allowed to touch them, you know, but, you know in a very obvious and clearly understood way. But I couldn't be in a room with them. You know, yeah, and the, the chaperones are very nice people. They weren't like hawk-like surveyors. <laughs> they, they would stand at the edge of the um, uh, rehearsal space looking benign, but they had immense power. At one point, a young woman ran from the um, <clears throat> hall in tears. So I went out into the corridor and asked her what the matter was, how, what, what's going on. She said that she felt that she should go home because she, she really ought to be revising for her A-levels, but she'd rather not do this. I said, and this is the kind of person I am, you should go home and revise for your A-levels. Theatre will never go away. <laughs> and she was weeping, and I said, I thought, fuck, I'm in a corridor alone with this 17 year old girl, and if they see me, they're really going to tell me off. I thought, I need a chaperone, how am I going to get one? I'm going to shout for once, but you know, it's a big building, and I, I can't go back in to get one because then um, I'm leaving her on her own. And then I saw at the far end of the corridor a chaperone. I, I said, hello, hello, um, and she came down, I said, whatever the young woman's name was, and she asked, and she's quite upset, would you like to talk to her? And I thought, poor, thank God for that. <laughs> okay, we're coming to the end of the morning session. Um, does anybody have anything, um, anything more they'd like to say? I mean, particularly about how the, their work has developed, um, that started in the outdoor outdoor arts, the street theatre of the seventies. Is there anything that um, that you'd like to add to that? I mean, this afternoon we're going to be talking about how techniques of that time have gone mainstream, and indeed we know, all know they have. Um, so some of that will be incorporated uh, into the afternoon. Um, but is there anybody that has anything to add to what we've been talking about, either anecdotally or um, from other? There we go. I'm Roland Thomas, one of the first and original members of National Theatre Company all those years ago, and then went on with Mitch to form Exploded Eye and so on. Um, I just wanted to say, in a sense, recapping on some of the things that have been said, that I can remember sitting around with Phil and a few other people and trying to reason why we wanted to do street theatre. And the logic was basically that nobody went to theatres anymore. And theatres were for yeah. the privileged middle class, the working class, the ordinary people in the street never went. And so therefore, you know, we were going to take theatre out onto the streets and into working men's clubs and uh, youth centres and so on to where people were. And that was the ethos behind the whole natural theatre company and the, I suppose the whole street theatre movement. Um, and what I really eventually I split off from Natural Theatre Company and formed Exploded Eye, which was about an amalgam of my previous thinking in terms of sculpture and colour and then performance. Um, and what was really most enjoyable about that was the fact that nobody knew what the hell you were doing. Because you were doing this thing that was undefined. Was it sculpture? Was it art? Was it theatre? Who knows? But you would, you would just go out and do this stuff in the streets and out in the landscapes and whatever, in Bath, unannounced. Um, and you'd get some brilliant reactions from members of the audience, if you like, because there wasn't an audience. There were just people who then were passing by, saw you and got intrigued by what you were doing. But they could put their own interpretations on what it was and what you were doing. And then suddenly somebody 
named it performance art and started giving out grants for it <laughs> and that killed it off as far as I was concerned. Um, but talking about sort of health and safety and stuff, there's also the aspect of um, the health and safety in fact of performers because I drew the short straw in Natural Theatre Company because we needed a fire eater and I ended up being the company fire eater. <laughs> And I was taught by another fire eater uh, who used petrol. Um, and so that was pretty sort of uh, hairy, really. I, I stuck the paraffin, you know, the safe stuff. But I can remember doing uh, a gig out at Warmley near Bristol in a piece of waste ground at night. Um, and it was a firework, hot air balloon, and explosion events. And my colleague here, Richard Dunnell to the left, was the inventor of the the wonderful paper hot air balloons that we used to use and stuff. And we had flares and explosions, fireworks going off. I was standing in a big ring of fire. Um, Mitch was there saying, I can't remember what the hell you were doing. And I was blowing flames and there was detonated explosions going off. And suddenly somebody tapped me on the shoulder. I turned back and there was this bloke standing there and said, Roland Thomas? I said, yes. <laughs> Roland Thomas, you from Carmarthen? I said, yeah. He said, yeah, your colleague over there, Nigel. Is it Nigel? Nigel Leach. He told me you're from Carmarthen. Oh, do you do this sort of thing down there? I haven't seen any of this in Carmarthen. I'm at college in Carmarthen. And I said, no, no, no. Um, something's about to blow up just where you're standing, you know. Uh, so there was a whole thing of the audience interfering with you and causing sort of your own health and safety issues as well. But... Uh, I've not been involved in uh, theatre or performance art for donkey's years, really, except that I ended up latterly, before I retired, working for the Arts Council of Wales, where I was actually on the other end of it. I was the funder, if you like, of a lot of uh, theatre and performance stuff in Wales and stuff. And it's quite interesting because, in some senses, certainly in Wales, things have come full circle and a lot, a lot of theatre groups from the early 70s ended up in exactly the same situation that we were working against back then. They got buildings, they established theatres, they converted them, and suddenly they had all the problems that theatres had 50 years ago of trying to get an audience, trying to keep the costs down and stuff, and, and make them financially viable. And also, I don't know if you could do the sort of stuff that we were doing today, because, for instance, a lot of the sort of things that we did now, in a sense, are echoed in, I have to say, a lot of the fairly dreadful living statue stuff that you see everywhere, you know. You can't move for it. And whilst I take your point that, that, that uh, theatre has moved on into things like Extinction Rebellion to great effect and stuff, um, I just don't think the audiences would have that sort of suspended disbelief in what you were doing today that we had then. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Mm. Can I just say one little thing? Um, uh, yeah, I, I was sort of peripherally um, involved in Exploded Eye with Roland and Mitch, um, and Roland has cleared up something that's puzzled me for the last 50 years, virtually, is the fact that nobody knew what the hell was going on. And <laughs> that was always my problem. I came along and helped out, but I never knew what we were doing. And I now feel relieved that I'm, I wasn't the only one. <laughs> thank you very much. OK, thank you very much, everybody. Um, it's now lunch. And there's a film. I think you all have the, the programme. We're having a, a, a look at a film. Um, performance art. Oh, Arts Council from 1973. So um, uh, I think we're eating and watching. Is that right? OK, so if we come back um, sort of just after half past one, we'll um, start the afternoon session.